For if you look at partner A, they can, above and beyond their own uh, problematic drinking, uh, or from their own family rejection related stress, um, they can impact their partner's drinking um, just about the same as their own. Um, and it really speaks to like what we, I think what we all know is the, the systemic impact of, of stressors and, and these negative outcomes. So adding in community connectedness as a moderator, um, what was not supported, what, what I had hypothesized was that for for partner A, um, we'll say, so go into, well, I won't go into too far, but for, for uh, same sex couples, they're considered interchangeable dyads. And so that's why it, everything's kind of going to be the same on the top and the bottom, but it helps to kind of like map this out. Um, so for partner A, uh, their own community connectedness, so, their, so partner A's connection to their own community didn't buffer the effects, didn't, didn't have a significant um, effect on their own uh, problematic alcohol use. However, if you look at the top here, so for partner B, partner B's community connection buffered that, that, that partner path, the partner effect. Um, so, uh, when partner A has a lot of uh, uh, stress related to family rejection, um, you know that can impact partner B's alcohol use. But if partner B is con connected to an LGBT community, um, that can that can buffer that that partner effect, um, and that's pretty cool. That's pretty amazing. Um, so what are the implications of this? Um, I think as family therapists, there's a lot of implications. Um, one is just, it kind of really shows the importance of connection um, and people being rejected from their family, even as adults. Obviously this is a sample, of, I think the minimum age was like 23, um, but that still has a significant am impact on people's lives, you know, as, as they move through adulthood. Um, and so, you know, it's not necessarily our job to change people's beliefs, but I think we, it is our job to promote positive, healthy relationships and promote connection uh, whenever possible. I think there's a lot of prevention implications, and so especially for LGBT youth and young adults, um, having a, a healthy connection to an LGBT community can be a huge preventative uh, measure in decreasing these health disparities, decreasing problematic alcohol use and substance use. Um, for couples therapists, I think this kind of speaks to some interesting places we can draw from. I don't know if we talk about different communities that, that we're involved in. It's, uh, to me, this speaks to the importance of, of being connected to com a community that you feel a part of and that you don't feel marginalized in, and you don't feel like you're, you're a minority. Um, and that can, really, that can really have a major impact on people's lives. And so, um, you know, do we talk to our clients about that? Do we talk to, when we're working with couples, do we, do we assess for the communities in which they're involved in or that they could be involved in? Um, is it different between partners? Does that matter? Um, and then I think incorporating this into substance abuse uh, treatments. I worked in a men's residential uh, substance abuse treatment and, and worked with couples and, and, and also worked with a lot of sexual and gender minorities in that context. And, you know, if nothing else, this is a great thing to encourage partners to do is stay connected to a community that they feel a part of um, as they're kind of help, helping their, uh, or going through the, the process of, of treatment with their partner or, or being involved in that treatment process. So some limitations, there's uh, potentially some measurement issues. Um, it was interesting that if you break this down, there was some um, actual De decrease in uh, drinking if you look at uh, certain subscales within this. Um, however, what we've been finding out is that some of these may be contraindicated. So maybe for somebody who is 20 years out from, from launching, that there, maybe there's a point if, if family rejection either doesn't, doesn't, isn't as stressful, or that maybe they had a point in which that uh, they decided to take a step back and, and uh, weren't as impacted uh, by that family stress. Um, like I said, there was certain limitations to doing dyadic data analysis with interchangeable dyads, a lot of equality constraints, and, and um, so I think there's some uh, future implications and research for, for that as well. Um, I'm curious as to know why community connectedness uh, 
buffered that that partner path and, and not the actor path. I think that's really interesting and so definitely a research question that I would like to follow up with. Um, yeah, I think that is all I have. Thank you. Uh, sexual orientation? Yeah, so it was a, a pretty decent split between uh, lesbian same-sex couples and, and, and male gay same-sex couples. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Did you control for that? Did not. I would suggest that. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. I have a yeah, oh. Dan. Or, um, maybe it wasn't part of your research question, or maybe you answered it, but was community connection also related to alcohol use on its own, like not, not thinking about the moderation effect? No. So, and initially I, I had uh, done a mediation model, and it didn't have any impact on that relationship, but adding it in as a, a moderator, it did. Okay. Were, was, were you guessing that community c connection would affect impact alcohol use? I wasn't totally sure because I think, I think there's two sides to that coin or obviously more than that. Um, but I had thought, yeah, there would be a community connection would uh, be associated with a, a decrease in problematic alcohol use. Quick question. Um, I, I think I saw on the, one of the slides um, about the uh, racial um, background of the individuals in this study. Can you tell me, do you have any hypotheses about um, race and how that might play out um, in terms of um, dynamics within the couple dyad? Within the couple's context? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. I mean, minority stress, it's it, one thing too, it's not, it's not uh, you know, kind of, we have this threshold that we meet and that's it. It's, it's compounds, right? So if we have multiple stigmatized identities, the stress just grows exponentially. Um, and so like, you know, we were uh, great presentation earlier thinking about uh, interracial couples, like, you know, maybe there's a, a interracial same-sex couple and one person is experiencing like much more, uh, uh, much more of these minority stress, and that's having a, a bigger impact. Um, but and then depending on the communities in which they kind of engage in, so there's you know the uh, racial communities that they engage with, or cultural communities that they engage with, and I think that um, is part of that question of like why why these communities are. are, are What's at play here? Um, why, are the, why is that important? And I think some, some of that will have to do with some of these other uh, aspects that weren't looked at in this particular analysis. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Or, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, just real quick, can you tell everybody, because uh, as far as I know, I think this is more sophisticated same sex dyadic data analysis done anything published today on FT yet. Can you tell us how, uh, how do you do just like the 20 second version? How do you, because a lot of people think you can't do dyadic data analysis with same sex couples. So how do we do that? Yeah, so essentially, uh, you know, you take your typical data set and you there, it's an arbitrary assignment of partner A and partner B. Um, and then, well, so I should say, you, you do it with Dr. Durchi is what you do. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, first you, you test for, for, to see if these, these are, are distinguishable dyads. So like, even though it was like we randomly split them into partner A and partner B, maybe they were still significantly different based on the variables that I was looking at, and they weren't. So they, they, they were distinguishable. Um, but then you kind of treat them as almost, I guess, like a multi-group where you would um, use partner A's alcohol use, partner B's alcohol use um, as two different variables, but you could you put a lot of uh, equality constraints and, and constraints on the parameters um, so that we can see these partner and actor effects that are going on. Yeah, thanks. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
pocket. No. Okay, you're gonna have to hold it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so uh, my name is Chelsea Spencer, and my study is looking at risk factors for intimate partner homicide, and I, con I conducted a meta-analysis. So approximately 13.5% of all um, homicides are committed by a former or current intimate partner. So about 38.6% of all homicides against women and about 6% of ho all homicides against men are committed by a former or current intimate partner. And again, to kind of highlight the gendered nature of intimate partner homicide, women are six times more likely to be murdered by an intimate partner than a man. So when we look at risk factors for intimate partner homicide, one of the leading recognized risk factors is a history of intimate partner violence. However, we know that not all couples who experience violence end up killing one another or one partner being killed. So research has really highlighted the importance of looking at the additional risk factors that might put a couple who have experienced intimate partner violence at risk for intimate partner homicide. And that is the purpose of my study, is to examine differences between couples who've experienced IPV intimate partner violence versus couples who have experienced intimate partner homicide. And I used a meta-analysis to systematically integrate the findings um, from all the literature that's been published on the topic. So my uh, study was guided by the exposure reduction hypothesis. And this theory suggests that intimate partner homicide is on a continuum of IPV as the most serious form and often occurs after prolonged um, violence. And that is why I chose to compare um, samples of intimate partner violence and intimate partner homicide in this study. So I conducted a meta-analysis and I searched for studies through uh, 1980 to May 2017. Um, I used a search criteria in uh, a number of search engines online. Uh, the inclusion criteria for my study was that the outcome variable had to be in, uh, attempted or completed intimate partner homicide. There had to be statistical information that allowed for the calculation of at least one bivariate effect size. It had to be written in English. And then lastly, the comparison had to be intimate partner violence. So some studies were excluded because they compared intimate partner homicide versus non-intimate partner homicide. And I really wanted to look at the intimate relation aspect of it. So um, through the search criteria, we originally found um, a little over 2,000 studies and we were, uh, narrowed it down to 17 studies and we had a total of 148 effect sizes. The uh, sample size, the total from all the studies was a little over 10,000 individuals in the meta-analysis. Um, we cross-coded 100% of the studies to ensure accuracy of the coding, and there was about a 99% agreement um, between studies. And uh, we used comprehensive meta-analysis 3.0 software to calculate the effect sizes. So for each risk factor that we found um, that had three or more effect sizes, or that we found in three or more of the studies, we conducted a, uh, a single meta-analysis for each risk factor included in the study. And then uh, we, we had an unadjusted odds ratio 
uh, we reported on that. So we were able to examine 15 risk factors looking at male perpetration of intimate partner homicide and 11 risk factors examining female victimization of intimate partner homicide. So I will try to go through the results quickly, but um, on the handout that I gave you are the detailed results, so you can, you can have that. Um, but, so the, the, by far, the strongest risk factor found for intimate partner homicide was the perpetrator's direct access to a gun. So that increased the likelihood by 11 times, or over 1,000% of the likelihood of a, thank you, of um, an intimate partner homicide occurring. So some of the next also very strong risk factors for intimate partner homicide were the perpetrator threatening the victim with a weapon, um, the perpetrator previously strangling the victim but non-fatally, um, the perpetrator exhibiting controlling behaviors, the, the perpetrator raping the victim previously, um, him threatening to harm the victim, maybe not necessarily with a weapon, just in general threats to harm the victim, and then also if the perpetrator had stalked the victim previously. So again, um, if the perpetrator had exhibited jealousy, specifically sexual jealousy, that increased the likelihood um, over two times that an intimate partner homicide would occur. If the perpetrator had a history of substance use, that increased the likelihood of an intimate partner homicide, as well as the perpetrator having less than a high school education or being younger in age, also increased the likelihood, as well as a history of mental health issues. Um, but those were lower, so for example, mental health issues only really increased the likelihood by 30% compared to 1,000 with, with the direct access to a gun. Um, it's also important to note that being violent towards others, which means being violent towards non-family members, and having a history um, of criminal charges, they were not significant risk factors for intimate partner homicide. Um, so for female victimization, the strongest uh, risk factor was being abused while pregnant. Other um, risk factors that increased the likelihood of an intimate partner homicide by over two times was if the victim had a history of substance use, she had a less than a high school education, she had recently separated from the perpetrator, and if she had children from a prior relationship. Um, being younger in age was not a significant risk factor for female victimization of intimate partner homicide. Um, again, if she had children with the perpetrator, the length of the relationship with the perpetrator, whether or not she was married to the perpetrator, her employment status or her income level were also not significant risk factors for intimate partner homicide. So for my study, one of the biggest findings was that the strongest risk factor was the perpetrator's direct access to a gun. It increased the likelihood of an intimate partner homicide by over a thousand percent, which really highlights the importance of keeping firearms out of the hands of abusers. Um, this law does say if someone is charged with a misdemeanor of uh, domestic violence, they should not be able to own a gun and how well that's regulated. Um, there's debate about that and it just really shows that that needs to really be enforced. This, uh, the results also support re uh, exposure reduction hypothesis. A lot of the next strongest risk factors were like non-fatal like non strangulation, rape, stalking, threatening with a weapon, so it really does kind of support this escalation of violence that happens in a relationship prior to a homicide. And to me that really states that we need to provide safe ways to leave abusive and dangerous relationships. Um, lastly, it's kind of important to look at the factors that were not significant. So the perpetrator's prior criminal history, if he's just a violent person, um, demographic factors and relationship factors were not significant. So it really goes to show we cannot stereotype who may or may not be at risk for intimate partner homicide 
because it happens in all relationships. It's not just violent people. This might be the person's first crime that they commit. So it's really important as clinicians to not make stereotypes about who's at risk um, just based off relationship factors or demographic factors. Um, just uh, limitations in future research. There was a lack of studies that were able to include in the analysis. Um, the meta-analysis that we're working on just looking at intimate partner violence has like over 700 studies. I was only able to find 17 on intimate partner homicide. And so this is just an area we need to continue to look at. Also, most of the studies that I had to exclude, they had no comparison sample. They were just looking at prevalence rates. So future research really needs to look at comparison samples. So what differentiates violence from homicide? And then lastly, there were several risk factors that just did not have enough effect sizes. So in the future, just looking at other risk factors that could um, possibly be important on this topic. Thanks. Questions for Dr. Spencer? I know, it's, I'm not used to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was on your committee, he's not our chair, but uh, I've already asked Chelsea tons of questions about this, and she really did a very nice job. But I'll let you ask the questions. <laughs> Uh, so what are you talking about direct access to a gun? Is that somebody just, is somebody owning a gun or is it sort of, do you know if there was like, if it's in the household or? Yeah, so um, I called it direct access to a gun because it was either like in their household or in their car, you know, like it was like in the moment they just, they could grab it and, and have direct access to it, yeah. So, and it didn't necessarily mean ownership, so even just like a family member. Yeah, that's a good like point. A yeah, it didn't mean or... ownership. Yeah, it was just in the home. A lot of the measures were just whether or not it was in the home or not. Sure. Uh, yeah. Well, I will go. Uh, so, what clinical implications? I mean, we, I think we say, I think we're all a little bit better at this when it's a suicidal client, a suicidal mm -hmm. patient. Making really specific suggestions about what we need them to do, what we need their parents to do. What kind of suggestions and how do you think that could work out if we've got a couple that's kind of violent and there's a couple guns laying around so you've been there in the house? What, do you, what would you suggest us, we should do as therapists? Yeah, so um, in the manuscript, I, I have added a little portion that. Um, it's standard practice for clinicians to ask about guns if you have a suicidal client, and I don't think it should be any different if you are working with a couple where there's been violence and just kind of inquiring if there is, you know, even locking up the gun or something like that because in these cases, and I've done um, a qualitative review of the literature, it's so impulsive. You know, it's like we're in an argument, boom. Like it's. Getting it to be harder to access the guns if they don't want to just totally get rid of them, I think would be helpful because there's just like such an aspect of impulsivity with the gun use, especially because it's so easy to just grab a handgun and kill your partner that finding a way, I would like hopefully just remove it from the home, but if not, at least making it harder to gain access to. Hi, Carmen. I just wanted to add it for our um agency experience around that, that we engage in safety planning immediately when we're working with couples that have reported or confirmed domestic violence that are still cohabitating and still um, together and that there is an accessible firearm in the home that it becomes one of those first steps um, in conducting family therapy, um, not only for the safety of the family, but also we do in-home and community-based therapy, so safety for therapists as well. And one of the things um, I know when I've been developing safety plans, it's been, well, if we can't get rid of it, can we lock it up? Can we make it inaccessible? Can you know we put it at a different location in the garage? Or you know, finding out, it is, it's like staying curious of where arguments tend to happen and things. Yeah. Um, and trying to make sure that the, the area is at least conducive 
to fighting fair and promoting safety. No, I, that's great. I'm, I'm like I'm glad you said that's kind of what like the same thought process. That's so great. <laughs> And actually, I uh, just want to add one other quick thing to that. Um, one of the things when you're working with couples, it's really important to always ask about it to be partner violence when you're doing an assessment, um, and not always just wait for whether or not they report it. I mean, you're talking about one in four couples who have uh, or experiencing partner violence, and it's even higher when you're talking about couples who are coming in into a clinical setting. So it really is something that, as part of your routine assessment, I really want to encourage everyone to make sure that you're asking about intimate partner violence. minute warning and then when it's time to wrap Knock them down. Thank you. All right, end of the day. <laughs> uh, hello again, I'm Leslie Anderson, um, second year student at the University of Georgia. So very briefly, this afternoon I'm gonna talk about the influence of community level trauma on individual levels of alcohol consumption in a Cambodian sample. So my objectives um, are to really emphasize um, the importance of considering contextual trauma um, on communities and individuals, as well as to explore the use of alcohol consumption with the, associ the association with post-traumatic stress symptoms, and also to discuss um, implications for us as practitioners in the critical importance of therapies that are cultural, um, sensitive, as well as responsive. So to give you some, some context, um, Cambodia is a Southeast Asian country bordered by Thailand, Laos, um, and Vietnam. And the majority of the population is of the Khmer ethnic group. And in 1970, um, a coup occurred in Cambodia and a regime known as the Khmer Rouge um, took total control of the country for about four years. Um, and this was known as one of the most severe um, genocides in, in recent history. And then so between that four year period, an estimated 2.2 to 2.8 million people um, were actually killed in the country of Cambodia. And so during the reign of the Khmer Rouge, on, on average, every Cambodian person witnessed about 10 um, traumatic events. Um, anything from lack of shelter to near-death experiences, um, torture, um, etc. And then post-conflict Cambodia is marked by a high prevalence of post-traumatic stress, um, as we would all assume, as well as somatic symptoms, anxiety, depression, um, anger, and resentment because of what happened um, during that time. When the Khmer Rouge took control of the country, only one mental health hospital existed. Um, <clears throat> and so Cambodians rely very heavily on traditional healers um, and traditional monks to really treat um, mental health disorders and diseases. The first Western mental health services were not established in Cambodia until 20 years after um, the Khmer Rouge regime ended in Cambodia. Today, however, um, Cambodia has a very thriving um, economy. It's one of the most fastest growing economies um, in the world, surprisingly enough. The people of Cambodia are extremely resilient, but a lot of Cambodians remain um, in severe poverty, and that's primarily in the rural regions. According to a 2014 um, World Health Organization report, per capita alcohol consumption in Cambodia has been increasing um, over the past several years. And so it's becoming a concern primarily in the rural regions because of accessibility, um, with alcohol being very cheap, but also very strong. In 2005, Jung et al. conducted a mixed method study um, looking at two particular rural um, regions in Cambodia and found that in these regions, alcohol use was not only encouraged, but was actually initiated 
at a very, very young age, as young as age five. It was seen as a sign of strength and also an important um, aspect of the social culture um, in Cambodia. And they also found that male gender was a strong predictor for both alcohol use disorder um, and heavy episodic drinking. And so what I was specifically interested in um, was looking at how community uh, level trauma really impacted um, alcohol use in the post-conflict Cambodia. And initially, I wanted to focus on both alcohol um, and drug consumption, but there was a lot of missing data um, in this particular sample with drug use. And there are a number of reasons uh, why that is, how the data was collected, and also the stigma attached to, to substance use. And so for those purposes, I focus specifically on alcohol use. And so I'm hypothesizing that community level trauma will significantly affect the individual levels of alcohol consumption and really guided by a theory of, of cultural um, trauma, which is pretty um, efficient to use when studying populations that are more communal um, and collectivist. And so, if you remember, for those returning um, fellows, this was a sample um, that I actually used last year. Um, just to give you a little bit of context, my major professor um, was a Fulbright during her time at UGA, and she's a faculty member now, but she traveled to Cambodia and has maintained partnerships um, with Cambodians, specifically at the University of Phnom Penh. And so we have access in our lab to a national um, Cambodian data, data set, which was the first of its kind, that looked at mental health um, issues in 2012. <clears throat> and so th they use a multi-stage um, cluster sampling technique, and the end was just under 2,700 um, individuals at least 21 years of age. And they also look specifically at these individuals by their district. And so there are 44 districts in Cambodia um, that are based on the 23 um, regions in Cambodia as well. There were a number of different measures, specifically the Harvard Trauma Questionnaire Symptoms Part, um, the Hopkins Symptoms Checklist, as well as the Cambodian Somatic Symptom and Syndrome Inventory. And these are all culturally adapted um, for Cambodian people as well. And so for my sample, once we eliminated all those individuals who responded that they never consumed any alcohol. Um, that brought <clears throat> my end down to just over 900. And so the average age, um, as you can see, was about 40, um, with the ranges from 21 to 73. The majority of them were male, majority were married, um, also farmers as the occupation. And then the average for the Harvard Trauma Questionnaire um, was about 1.43, and the clinical cutoff is about um, 2.0. And again, this is a 16 measure that asks questions related to um, PTSD symptomology. And then out of that 925, um, 121 participants reported um, daily alcohol consumption. And so for the data analysis, I was very ambitious um, and chose to utilize multi-level modeling. And so with multi-level modeling, you first aggregate your, your data um, based upon um, what SPS calls a break variable. And so since I was looking at um, the mean level HTQ, how that would predict individual levels of alcohol consumption, SPSS allows me to break those HTQ scores down by the district um, the individuals live in. And so after that I conducted correlations and then um, conducted the, the models based on my hypothesis equation. And so very, very briefly, why multi-level modeling? Like I said, with this data set, the individuals are nested within 44 um, different districts based upon the 23 regions that exist in Cambodia. And multi-level modeling, as my professor likes to uh, say, is like regression on steroids. Um, and so it allows you to really take into consider consideration context 
which I think is hugely um, important. So it's a pretty complex type of analyses. And so you can also look at individuals or students that are nested within classrooms or, or various uh, schools families nested within communities, and then employees nested within businesses. You can also utilize HLM, or multi level modeling, if you have longitudinal data and you have repeated um, measures or repeated observations with the same individuals. Um, the challenge with nested data is that it violates um, the independence assumption required by traditional analyses like ANOVA or OLS multiple regression. And so those more traditional analyses might result in, in type 1 errors and bias parameter estimates. And so these are just my basic correlations. Um, primarily, sex um, was significant on all of the variables. Um, the trauma questionnaire, the alcohol consumption, um, the district in which individuals live, as well as the age. And so based upon my prediction equations, the first model was just a simple um, random intercept model, which looks a lot like um, the basic ANOVA model. So I'm looking at alcohol consumption as the outcome variable, and then um, the district level effects. And so <clears throat> the coefficient was 2.67 with a standard error of 0.04. And then I didn't include it on the slide, but the model um, for model A, the district effect was 0.054, and it was not significant. And then for model B, I included um, the district mean HTQ, which was so the intercept was 3.05, standard error of 0.48, and then a negative 0.27 and 0.34. And my second model was also not significant. Um, and then thirdly, I included the, um, the individual HTQ score as a predictor as well. And this model was also not significant. But along with um, running your models with HLM, you can also look at the intra-class correlation. So this was like my beam of, of hope uh, with each of the models. I did find a very, very small effect.